Hey everyone, in this AP Chem series video, we're going to take a look at ionic solids. First, remember that we've already seen several different types of solids like molecular, ionic, metallic, and covalent network, and in this video, we'll just take a closer look at one of those called ionic solids. Here on my general form of a lattice structure, we can see that ionic solids are composed of cations and anions, and like all cations and anions, they're held together with ionic bonds. Sodium chloride or common table salt is a great example of an ionic solid. It's made of a repeating array of positive sodium cations and negative chloride anions. You can see them being arranged here. Notice how each positive is surrounded or lined up next to negative ions to maximize the attractive forces between them. And you end up with a solid structure that looks something like this. Here's a moving version of the same thing. A slightly more complex example might be lead nitrate, which has positive lead cations attracted to the polyatomic anions known as nitrate ions. It's worth mentioning again that ionic solids do not form molecules. Anytime you see a formula for an ionic substance, that formula simply represents the ratio between the ions in the solid. In lead nitrate, for example, you'd find one lead for every two nitrate ions. How you identify ionic substances is by looking for metals bonded to nonmetals. We saw that in both of our examples already. Make sure to take some time and write down these key ideas. Let's now take a look at some ionic solid properties, starting with melting point. If you wanted to melt an ionic solid, you'd have to take the ionic bonds between the ions and start to break them. Since ionic bonds are extremely strong, lots of heat energy is going to be needed to do this, and for that reason, ionic solids tend to have very high melting points. We can also make comparisons between the melting points of two or more different ionic solids. Let's do that by comparing sodium chloride with lithium chloride. Both of these substances contain chloride ions, so the key difference is between lithium and sodium. Sodium is further down the alkali metals column, which tells me that it is larger. Lithium is closer to the top, which tells me that it's going to be smaller. If you imagine drawing a line from the center of one of the sodium ions to the center of the neighboring chloride, you can see that the distance is fairly long. If you did the same thing from the center of a lithium ion to the center of its neighboring chloride, because the lithium ion is smaller, that distance is shorter. According to Coulomb's law, anytime charged particles are closer together, like we've got with our lithium and chloride ions, there's going to be a stronger attraction between them. Now I can say that smaller ions will have stronger ionic bonds. That, of course, is going to lead to a higher melting point. Let's also compare sodium chloride to magnesium oxide. Magnesium oxide is an ionic substance where the ions have plus two and minus two charges. Since the charge magnitudes are greater, a stronger attraction is going to exist between those ions than would between sodium and chloride ions. We can summarize this by saying greater charge magnitudes lead to stronger ionic bonding and higher melting points. Make sure to take some time and write down these key ideas related to melting point. Next, let's take a look at electrical conductivity. For a substance to conduct electricity, it needs to be made of charged particles that can move and flow. Do ionic solids have these mobilized charged particles? Well, they do have cations and anions, which are charged, but in the solid state, they can't move, so it will not conduct electricity. If, however, you took those solid state ions and melted them, once in the liquid state, now the cations and anions can move around so they would be able to conduct electricity. A similar thing happens when you dissolve ionic substances. Here on the left, you can see the ions in the solid state can't change positions, but as they dissolve in these water molecules, they start to move around, and then electricity would be able to be conducted. We can summarize this by saying that ionic solids do not conduct electricity, but molten and dissolved ionic substances will. And lastly, we'll take a look at a new property called malleability. This is the quality of being able to be shaped, and there's lots of ways to shape a solid. You can hammer it, press it, extrude it, etc. Here you see a gold bar being crushed because gold is very malleable. So let's take a look at how this might work with ionic solids. Here's a simple model of an ionic solid, and I'm, and I'm going to imagine applying some pressure using this hammer. 
As I apply pressure, that row is going to get realigned and pushed downwards until like charges face each other. You can see here the negatives line up with the negatives and the positives line up with the positives. When they do that, those like charges are going to do what like charges do, which is repel one another, and that entire row is going to break off. Since this happens quite easily with ionic solids, we say that they are brittle and not malleable. Make sure to take some time and write down this key idea as well. That also wraps up this video on ionic solids. Thanks a lot for watching and here's a brief summary.